G'day dear friends, my name's Thomas. It's another fantastic day in sunny Melbourne. It's currently raining, but fear not because today we're taking a trip across the pond to Japan and we are having a look at the Pacific Flying Machine's Hayabusa race frame. So a quick backstory on how I discovered this frame. Basically, over the various lockdowns and COVIDs, I've been keeping in touch with a lot of my friends overseas. And with that too, a lot of my Japanese friends, which basically led to me discovering that one of my friends started manufacturing frames and motors. I think he's even got tiny whoop motors now. And his take on a top plate frame is really, really interesting. So I wanted one for myself. Uh, he kindly sent one to me to try out with the motors. So we're gonna take a look at that today and hopefully get it built. If the rain goes, maybe we can even sneak in a test flight. We'll see how we go. Okay, so this is all of the parts laid out. As you can see, there's some extra bits here that you don't normally see in a conventional race frame. What I'm going to do now is get this thing all assembled. What we'll do is link the video I'm referencing in the description for the assembly. But what you'll see now is a quick time lapse. So this is the fully assembled frame here, minus the 3D prints. Basically some of the special features of this, or probably the biggest special feature, is this crazy bottom plate structure here. And the whole idea behind this is because you've got pieces in the center, you should have really, really good center stiffness. But then the other part that's really nice about this is by removing these two sort of big locking bolts here, and then removing the four standard M3 bolts, you can have the whole bottom plate lift off without your arms falling apart, without the whole thing losing its structure. So it means that as far as replacing individual bits go, this should be a little bit more serviceable than other frames. So the frame's assembled and ready to go. Let's actually get this thing fully kitted out with a set of parts, and then let's get this thing airworthy. To get this thing airworthy, we need a powertrain. So starting with the motors, we're going to be using the PFM Enzo motors. These are a 2207 1800 kV, and as far as I know, they are exclusive for the Japanese market. That being said, they do look really, really beautiful, and if they fly anything like how they look, I think they're gonna be spectacular. We have an airframe, we have motors, now we need an ESC and a flight controller. For that, we're turning to Foxia and actually some pre-production components. So I guess the semi-goal of this is that we're going to find out if these are ready for production and if these are no compromise. I'm hoping to get a lot of life out of this quad. So what I'm doing is mounting the capacitor to the ESC using motor wires. What this will allow for is a little bit of dampening at the connections. Rather than having a solid point that vibrations will vibrate apart, we've got a flexible cable that will just bend and not break. So we've got the nano camera out and ready to install. One of the things to work out is whether to use on the carbon bracket there's a low bolt option, which is about here. I think the wire, uh, the actual connector might interfere with this cable too much. And then there's also a top option, which is what I think I'll go for, but it's higher up, which means the feel will be probably better. 
but then also the camera is closer to being the first point of impact. So that's sort of a, if you want durability or sort of a better feel, I guess. The other thing is too, I know I've seen a lot of the Japanese guys running TPU mounts, sort of like a little sleeve that you pop the camera into. That'd be a really good option too. In this case, the carbon's already here, so I'm just gonna stick with that. But I can see where a 3D printer would be really handy for this. So one really cool thing about this design is actually the way the fins mount to it. So this is one of the options here, and the other option is this guy over here. And the way they mount is basically you have a little slot, it just lines up and then slides in, and that's it. You've got the turtle mount that you want. Realistically, I think this one will actually perform better in the real world because there's no hard points for it to like catch onto anything. That one looks better. But this one looks so much better in my opinion. So I'm gonna stick with this for the looks. It means I may actually just end up skewering myself into the ground, especially because it's going to be a swamp probably at the next race. But uh, this looks better and if you think you look good, then you fly good. So this is the wiring layout and parts layout I've decided to go for. Realistically, I think there's going to be a better way to actually mount this than what I have, but this is the best I could find. Um, I can see why some of the other 3D prints they use with different mounted uh, turtle fins, etc. actually tend to work quite well with this design. Um, so now what we do... Flip this over like so. Now we pop in this bracket. In hindsight, I didn't really need this bracket with the way I laid out the parts, but... It is very pleasing. You're talking about the um, TPU part, aren't you? Yeah, for the antenna. It, it wasn't really necessary, I think, for this. I think it looks better. Sorry. probably the way they would have wanted it built anyway, so... Yeah, well, the designer said that he just wanted me to build it exactly how I would build it myself. So he on purposely said he was trying to not give me information. Like, he just wanted me to build it and see what I so did. So if you made mistakes and all that, he wants to learn from all that, isn't it? He wants to learn from that. He wants to know what he can improve for the future designs. Uh, which is hard because it's so subjective. I've always been sort of leave it in the idea of the designer and then follow what they do. But in this case, he wanted to see how other people approach his build. And then I guess he's going to tweak his design, st design style to accommodate. Uh, which is actually... It's clever. It's a really clever idea because I think he's going to make things that people actually want that will work for more use cases. Whereas my approach has always been, I'm building something for me. And you need to build this exactly the exactly way Exactly the I'm way doing. I do. <laughs> I'll, in general, be less useful anyway. I'll be like, well, it's not my part, so I don't know. Yeah. So it's probably something I need to improve in myself. But uh, what I will probably do to maybe adjust for that is probably release some other designs that aren't what I actually race. Okay. So things, things that are a bit more versatile, which we've actually needed because we do a lot of testing. Uh, so we actually do use a lot of other frames at the moment for testing other than the JS1 because it isn't built to carry certain things. Other times we've used like the custom brackets to do other crazy things like running HD systems that were never intended to be used on it. But even though it was more of a testing thing than an actual, this will work properly thing. <laughs> <laughs> this is coming along really nicely. It is, it's actually gonna be I think a pretty clean build, so. Before I actually screw this on, I'm going to see if I can clean that up a bit. Just adjust the way some of the wires route, just to pull everything off of the flight controller as quick as possible. Uh, in general, the less things touching the flight controller, the less things sort of vibrating it, adding extra movements that shouldn't be there, the better performance you end up. What I'll do, I think next, uh, close this up, get everything set up with a bass tune. I'll probably just run the one that I used on the Foxia quad because that seems to be a really versatile tune. That Foxia tune was actually just a variant of the JS1 tune made for 4.3. We don't have an official 4.3 JS1 tune yet, but we'll work on something eventually. Uh, that being said, I think we'll start there, see if this is working. If there's weird resonance issues, I'm gonna redo the wiring in a cleaner way, readjust the way things are facing, and then, yeah, we should be on the money. So there we go, that is the completed build. The next step for me is to set up all of the software and make sure everything is working as it should. 
The processes I'll use for that is exactly the same as what I did for the Foxia video, but I'll be using the settings that are in the final part of that series. Then we'll get it up and get it flying. You'll probably see that in a video not long from now. I have a race tomorrow that I was hoping to get this ready for, but realistically, it's still raining out in Melbourne, so I'm not sure I'll be able to actually test it beforehand. But this will race. I cannot wait to see how it performs. It's so cool to have a setup that is something that's actually sold exclusively in Japan. It's just mind-blowing. It's so cool. I feel very special right now. So very big thank you to Pacific Flying Machines for giving me the opportunity to build this. I love it. I love the way it looks. I can't wait to fly it. G'day guys, Thomas here, out here in beautiful sunny Melbourne, and today, this actually might be a continuation of a video that we're making. So just in case, hey guys, Thomas here, if not, okay, so we're at the uh, field today, and what we're doing is trying out the Pacific Flying Machines Hayabusa race frame with Enzo Motors. Uh, this is all Pacific Flying Machines equipment here, and then a Foxia stack with TBS, component, everything. It's the usual, we'll put the, all, the set, all the parts in the description anyway. But yeah, we did the, what do you call it? Blah, my brain build is dead. Video. We did the build video. We've maidened it in a park when it was not sunny and beautiful. Now it is sunny and beautiful. And it was raining before too. It was raining before too. But it's now sunny and beautiful. Let's actually get some first track impressions. The thing I was surprised with at the park was the fact that it felt a lot lighter than it actually is. Like. I'm used to sort of what quads feel But it wasn't lately. flying on a track, was it? It wasn't flying on a track. We have a track out today. It is a small track, but you can still build up a lot of speed in this. So let's just get a sort of first track impression before I actually send this thing out into a real race. We have the correct battery strap this time. There we go. Wow, that's using the full length of this stand. <laughs> I'm gonna try a pivot launch. Beauty. Oh, less beauty. Okay, my stand's a little too small, too small, but <laughs> that's okay. I'll uh, I'll flat launch for this one. Um, if we end up racing at MMRC, that'll make an interesting part of the story. But if we're at Eastside, their stands are bigger, so we'll be safe there. So, there you go. The joys of stretch frames. <laughs> okay. I'm running? Yep. Yep. Okay, let's go out here in the sun where it's nice and warm. That's running. We're good to go. Let's, uh, let's set some laps. Get sort of a first track impression. Wow, those motors are very in front of my face. Okay. Oh, the lens is a bit dirty from when I flipped it just a second ago. Wow, it's smooth there. Yeah, it's really still carrying that feeling of being light. I mean, I'm not pushing it to the limit yet, but usually it'll already be feeling kind of heavy, and it's really not. Maybe in that back corner a bit, because I'm at peak throttle. It starts to feel almost like they're at the limit, but the limit's very approachable. It's very controllable. Overcook that a bit. Wow. Yeah, okay, sorry I didn't talk much through that. Um, no, the same feeling totally carried across. I think in the very first corner and the very, or second last corner, like the last flag, you can feel the weight a little bit, but you don't feel it like, oh, the quad's heavy. You just sort of found yourself at the oh, upper... No. Dead stick? Ah! Whoa! That's actually a really good job. That's in the tall grass. That plane's been having issues the whole time, but uh, our good buddy Roscoe, he's uh, persisting with it. He's making it work. 
So I think it's actually got an old fuel tank and it's uh, consistent fuel starvation. He's working through it there. Back to the uh, Hayabusa. Yeah, it keeps that feeling. Those last two corners is the only time you might feel the weight, but it was more... I think it masks its weight by feeling really good. It's actually, like, I kind of, I really want you to fly it if you don't mind, Dad. And okay. Yeah, see what you think, because... I think the difference is the limit's very approachable. I suspect there are other quads that might be faster, but this feels very easy to wield and very easy to get comfortable with. Um, not that I've driven a GTR before, but I've heard a lot of people see like the R35 GTR uh, as a very approachable car where you can get to the limit very quickly. And I guess this could be maybe a similar thing. I've driven a GV GTR, so I don't really know, but it felt very approachable. It felt very safe, like you could get to the limit and get to a really high speed. I'm curious to see what the lap times are like. It just felt very comfortable, it felt very homely. Just something that you could sort of, I mean, I've been flying different quads the whole day and I just jumped onto that and it was like, yeah, this is comfortable, I could that start pushing it. That was your first pack. It was my first flight on it, it's my second flight on it ever. So... Oh right, yeah, you're right, wow. It's, like, the, I'd say there are other quads that might be quicker, but they take time to get used to. This was very easy to get the speed. There were areas I was blowing wide. The uh, first corner, the sort of split S section, and then some of the slaloms I'd overcook around the back area. That could be sort of me hitting the limit a bit and sort of not predicting the quad very well, putting the inputs in a touch too late. Uh, but those are all fixable things. Those are things that I need to fix with my piloting. And like I said, based on two packs, it's not unreasonable to say that give myself another three and those aren't gonna be issues anymore. So I'm actually really impressed. I have a feeling this is going to be something that's very easily able... Different words. It's going to be something that's... I clapped. <laughs> it's going to be something that's very easy to capitalize on in a real race, where you've got nerves, where you've got... you starting cold. This is about as cold as you can possibly start, as far as a new quad goes. And I was still able to pilot it very confidently. So this is something that maybe even come a real race actually tends to perform even better than what it would show on a normal sort of test and track day. So there you go, that was the Pacific Flying Machine's Hayabusa frame. Really, really happy with how it's performing so far and I can't wait to see how this thing goes on track. I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. Be ready for more to come soon. See? Oh, see? <laughs> ah! Okay, ready? Here we that go. That was really good. Okay. Go. There you go, that was the Pacific Flying Machines Hayabusa race frame with the Enzo motors and then whatever other components are in there too, you can check those in the description down below. I hope you guys have enjoyed this video and hopefully we'll catch you on the track soon. Happy flying, see you in the next one.